Welcome, and I want to just thank you all for being a part of this unique experience as we explore Henry Nouwen's The Return of the Prodigal Son. Uh, the main focus of what we're trying to determine uh, is in the value of this work for the benefit of inner healing and spiritual discovery. Uh, for many people, when crisis and difficulty comes to them, especially in the context of their relationships uh, with others, we sometimes end up m missing the opportunity for something transformative to happen in our lives as a result. Instead, all of our focus becomes on the other person, how we can help them, how we can reconcile with them, how we can deal with the situation, and it ultimately comes this uh, exercise in looking outwardly rather than looking inwardly in our lives. So why this book? Why did I choose to do a focus group uh, involving Nowen's work here? Because I believe the idea of having a prodigal in our lives means more than than someone who's walked away from their faith. I believe prodigals represent to us a rejection, a rejection of our ideas, a rejection of our way of life, our values, our beliefs. And sometimes that rejection is manifested in, in very painful ways. We often see uh, this person embark upon the, the road of self-destruction and we're left at the railroad crossing, begging and pleading them to get off the tracks because of the inevitable collision with the train that's coming down the, the tracks. They can't see that sometimes, but, but we can. Um, and we see this person at times lash out against us, making us the enemy. They're the ones who bring divisiveness in our lives. They'll turn others against us. They'll somehow make themselves the victim and make us the enemy. Uh, we become the cruel one or the insensitive one, the abuser, um, whatever label you want to put on that. Um, but what if all of this isn't about them? What if this is a part of the journey in which the Lord is allowing us to travel on for our own benefit. The question is, would it be worth it? So one of the big problems is, is how do we deal with prodigals? Well, step one, I would say, is let's begin with ourselves. And that's where Nowen's book has its greatest value. I'm sure by now that you've already begun to dive into the book and into the prologue and introduction. Nowen's reflection upon Rembrandt invites us into his world and to his journey. And for those of you who may not be familiar with, with Henry Nowen, this book is a reflection uh, really of his lifelong journey. He was born in the Netherlands in 1932 in a Catholic home, and, and Nowen would often say, I, I grew up in a very protected and safe environment, and I learned to know that I was Dutch and I was Catholic. And it took me quite a long time to discover that there were many people who were neither. And as a youth, he was uh, part, experienced the Second World War as dangerous and exciting rather than you know, really comprehending its deep, deep significance. Um, at times, he had to bicycle into the country to find food. Sometimes he had to hide his father from the Germans. That was the kind of life that he had growing up. Uh, he was a very good student growing up. And in, 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 early at the age of six, he had this great desire to become a priest. His maternal grandmother had made a, even a child-sized altar and made vestments for him so that he could celebrate the Eucharist with his siblings and playmates in the attic of their home. Uh, when Nowen was older, he spoke about the two voices he heard as a child. The voice of his mother praised and affirmed him as he was and called him always to love Jesus. And the voice of his father was proud of his accomplishments and encouraged him and challenged him to become better and a more successful person. Uh, Nowen commented that he lived the first part of his life listening more to the voice of his father, while uh, the second part of his life listening more to the voice of his mother. Uh, between 1950 and uh, 1963, Nowen attended seminary in the Netherlands. He was ordained as a priest. He went on to graduate school. He became a chaplain in the Dutch Army. And finally, in 1964, he came to the United States and he was granted a fellowship at the Maringer Clinic in Topeka, Can in Topeka, Kansas, the study of religion and psychology, the relationship between the two. And that's where he received his CPE, or his clinical pastoral education training at Topeka State Hospital. This interaction between religion and psychology would be reflective in much of Henry's writings and works. Um, he was fascinated with the human condition and, and how it related and interacted with our relationship with Christ. It was Henry who also popularized the idea of being the wounded healer, which was the title of one of his 
uh, first works written in 1972 in which we as wounded individuals are able to take our woundedness and bring healing and life to others. From 1966 to 1971, Henry went on to teach at Notre Dame, and he also went back to the Netherlands where he headed up the Behavioral Science Department at a Catholic Theological Institute. While in the Netherlands, Henry also received his doctorate in 1971. From 1971 to 1981, Henry returned to the United States. He taught at Yale. He wrote several books during this time. Uh, he spent time as a Trappist monk in Gen Genesee Abbey. Uh, he returned to Yale as a full professor at Yale uh, of Pastoral Theology. And it was during these years uh, that Henry's mother, the person he would consider the closest person to him on the face of the earth, died from inoperable cancer. And this devastated Henry, and, and in that process he returned to the, the Abbey in Genesee, New York. And then in 1981 he gave up his tenure at Yale and resigned. So from that point, from 1981 to 1985, Henry be began this quest for significance in his life. He spent a lot of time in Latin America among the poor and oppressed, and he was greatly impacted and distressed by what he had observed. Uh, during that time, also in 1983, he accepted a part-time teaching position at Harvard University, and again, spent time during those years, uh, that year, going to the poor in Latin America. In 1983, Henry made his first visit to a place called Larsh, which is a community which was a community for the mentally disabled, uh, people who couldn't take care of themselves, uh, who were uh, adults who had no one else, and this community would be the only place that these people would consider home. And this Larsh, uh, Larsh, excuse me, Larsh community was in France. Uh, in 1985, Harvard, Harvard, Henry left Harvard and spent a year at France at L'Arche. Uh, the impact was so great upon him that in 1986 uh, through 1996, Henry decided to join the L'Arche community called Daybreak, which was in T Toronto, Canada. And that was a quite a transition for him because he'd spent so many years uh, teaching students at Harvard and Yale and, and having large theological discussions and, and really being able to engage and interact with people coming to a community of people who most of them couldn't even read. They didn't even know who Henry was. Uh, so he had a very difficult time processing uh, his place in L'Arche, but eventually uh, this place became home to him. This be became the one place uh, that he, uh, we'll even talk about in the book, that, that he called home. Uh, after years of being what he would call his, his prodigal journey. Um, during that time, though, at large, he suffered uh, many things. He had a nervous breakdown in 1988 as a result from uh, just a, a very stressful relationship uh, that he had. Uh, he was also severely injured and almost died when he was hit by a car as a pedestrian in 1989. Yet all this time, uh, even during his sufferings, he continued to write he continued to make himself available to people to minister to. Um, finally, on, night, on September 15th, 1996, Henry suffered a heart attack while traveling to do a documentary on the return of the prodigal son, which is the book that we're reading. And he died from a massive cardiac arrest on September 21st, 1996. This is just a sampling of, of Henry's life. Uh, it was incredible, yet it was very complicated. If you read his works, you, you'll see a common theme that runs through them. Uh, Henry often wrote and talk about, talked about our need to understand that we are the beloved of God and, and what that truly means for us. For Henry, uh, it was a call for intimacy with the Father, which was knowing and being known by God. It was an opportunity to be fruitful in our lives. Uh, Henry also you often talked about the difference between being fruitful and being productive, that, that we are called to be fruitful, not just to fill our lives full of meaningless things that we do over and over, but really to find the thing that makes us fruitful in our lives. Uh, he also embraced the picture of community in the body of Christ. The words he most frequently used were hospitality and home. And hospitality for Henry was creating a space for others so that they could discover that they were the beloved of God. Home was that place where we could let uh, down all of our guards to be who we are without fear and rejection and, and open ourselves up to the possibility of intimacy with God and others, void of fear and guilt and shame.
everyone said, I, I believe you can look at solitude, community, and ministry as, as three disciplines by which we create space for God. If we create space in which God can act and speak, something surprising will happen. You and I are called uh, to these disciplines if we want to be his disciples. Um, as you read his books, you, you see certain themes run through, uh, and you'll certainly see it run through the, the Return of the Prodigal. What is most fascinating about this book is it's not just a story about Henry's journey through life, or it's not just about Rembrandt's story, as well as the story that, that Jesus gave us in the Gospel of Luke. You know, it's kind of a combination of, of all of these together, and yet it's also inviting us into the story as well. Uh, Henry was a, a very complicated man. On, on one side, he was a teacher and writer and pastor who helped many people navigate through their journey of faith in order to find purpose and value and significance by offering love and grace, by offering the love and grace of God in a way that uh, could be received in their one's life. On the other hand, Henry was also a very needy man. He was longing for a place to belong, longing for intimacy with others, longing to find a greater meaning in life. And the irony of the return of the prodigal son is that Henry doesn't have any prodigals in mind as, he, as he's writing this book other than himself. So this book reflects this unmet place in Henry's heart to find that home where he can belong once and for all, bringing together the, the younger son in himself, the older son in himself, and, and ultimately discovering the father in himself by becoming that home for others. So the question for us as we read is, is can we learn? Can we find healing? Can we find ourselves as the beloved as we view the journey of another person. And while we're looking at this journey of another, can we be vulnerable enough to examine our own lives and to see ourselves as ever so part of the exact same story? Uh, as you reflect on the introduction of this book for the remainder of this week and observe the Rembrandt painting, allow yourself to consider your own journey. Uh, how did you get there, here? How, uh, what road did you travel? Where would you be in this painting? Take time to create a foundation for yourself, a reference point as to where uh, to go from. You know, where, where are you gonna go from here? Also, I want you to take time to think about that person who's a prodigal in your life. Where do they fit? Uh, but try to do this without the absence of your own feelings and, and see, try to see life through their eyes. Uh, so at this time, I'd just like to just pray for us as we begin this journey and um, see what God would do with it. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to explore uh, this book and your insight into it as well as our own. <clears throat> we ask God that you would make the story of the prodigal son come alive to us, not just in our minds, but in our hearts. God, let it do something uh, significant in our lives. Let it bring healing. Let it bring a change. Let it bring a greater understanding and wisdom. I pray for each one who's a part of this study. I pray, God, that you will lead them and guide them and make this a very fruitful experience in their lives. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this week.